Charlie, it's so good to connect with you, man. And I, I really admire what you do. I think you have such a fascinating like career and the, the things you've been a part of. Like I just, I love how it's not like all this one thing from what I can tell on the outside looking in. It, it just seems like a, a variety of really, really cool things. So um, just thanks for spending some time to hang out with me and my audience and share some of your wisdom with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Graham. So I, can I dive right into like a, a philosophical question, like a, a, a big it. question? Because I've heard yeah. you say, what is the meaning of life? Yes. What is, can you please explain it, Charlie? I've been having so many guests on to try to figure this out. Maybe you can figure it out for us. But um, you, you said in an interview, I think I've heard you say that you stumbled on this idea of play, um, which you become known for, because even though you were very successful, you felt dead and empty inside, which are big words. I don't want to put those in your mouth, but I think I heard you say that. So maybe just, can you walk us through what were you feeling? What was that like as someone who was successful, wasn't maybe feeling what you thought you would feel um, and how this led to this discovery of play? And and, because I think other people can identify with that who are listening to this. Totally. Yeah. So the story is I suddenly found myself just completely and utterly burned out. I suddenly was experiencing these physical and emotional symptoms that I'd never really grappled with. I felt like I was afraid all the time. And I felt like in social interactions, like I, I would, I was on the verge of just like shattering and crumbling. Mm -hmm. And I always felt on edge, always felt like somebody was about to fight me or yell in my face. Like it was that kind of feeling of just always being on edge. And it was really embarrassing uh, to deal with. You know, this was back in 2011, 2012, I believe. And, you know, the the TikTok generation has uh, been blessed in that there's transparency around like human mm. emotions. And it's like, oh, okay, anxiety is a, a, a thing. And uh, this is what it is. I, I'd never even really heard of it as like a diagnosed condition or anything. So when I went into uh, the doctor, they were like, hey, you're sleep deprived, which was correct. And they're like, you're dealing with anxiety. Just take these pills and they'll like make it go away. Oh, man. And I was like, oh, amazing. I didn't Great. like I didn't think it was going to be this easy. And so I I like skipped home back to my apartment and then right before I was about to take him, I was like, I should probably look up if these things actually work or what the potential side effects are. Just do some due diligence. And I just went down this rabbit hole where it was people just saying, like, it worked for like a week and then it stopped. And now I'm addicted to them. Oh, and man. when I looked at the side effects, it was like side effects include addiction, seizures, psychosis, and anxiety. <laughs> Wait, and so I was like, what? And, and um, so I, I had to make a hard decision at that point. Like, do I, because at, at that point, I, I really was feeling like I was stuck in this internal state of hell. My, I'll never forget my ex-girlfriend telling me, Charlie, you're, you're not the man I met. Like what happened to you? What is going on? And to your point earlier, you know, it's the first time I really opened up to someone in my life. And I was like, I feel dead inside all the time. And I don't know how to fix it. And I remember she started crying. And I felt jealous that she could cry because I, wow. I just really felt hollow. And that like the only um, thing that I was in such like a low frequency state that I couldn't get anything above fear. It sucked. Fear and exhaustion. Oh. And um, so uh, I, I knew, a part of me knew that I could get myself out, but I didn't, I wasn't willing to take the risk that came with the pills. And so I threw those away and just kind of committed to myself mentally that whatever got me in this place, you know, so be it, I'll find a way to get myself out. And I spent the next um, year and a half just experimenting 
with everything I thought had potential. So I tried like kind of the tried and true methods of like meditation, therapy, different therapy modalities, uh, yoga, different types of exercise, um, variations of like quote unquote clean diets, um, elimination of stimulants, uh, you know, fasting. I did a five day uh, fast with nothing but water and then eventually did a nine day fast. Uh, I did, uh, flotation tanks. I did psychedelics, supplements, everything in whole foods, you know? And, um, I even found like a six week course online specifically for men with anxiety. And, uh, at the end of all this experimentation, nothing had worked, nothing for like a year and a half. And, I remember assessing like, wow, like some things worked for a few hours, some things even worked for a few days, but it all kept coming back. And even with focusing on sleep and all this stuff, like it was still there. And, um, you know, there were a number of factors that led up to this. Like, I think it's, I saw this Australian blogger write this article about me where he just like blamed, you know, like harsh work conditions. And it's like, that wasn't it. You know, it was like, there was a variety of things going on. Um, I uh, found out, you know, like a close friend of mine had attempted suicide, a family member died in in the same 24 hour period. Um, And then this deadline for this massive project that Tim Ferriss and I were working on got moved back six months. And, um, and coupled with a handful of of other things. And I was just like, you know, I, I certainly like pushed myself. Um, when I was running this conference, I, I, for four days took modafinil, which is like designed for people with narcolepsy and military fighter wow. pilots for them to stay awake. And so I slept for six hours over 96 hours, you know, wow. six hours total over four days and like got a standing ovation, you know, uh, for being awesome at what I did. Like the whole <sighs> conference was like, Charlie's amazing. Like, where do I get a Charlie? And, um, you know, it was just kind of the norm in Silicon Valley at the time. I was, uh, um, I I had a friend in medical school. She was popping Adderall constantly, you know, uh, a number of my friends were, were very much like, you know, let's, let's get up early work until we're, we're about to pass out and then we'll, we'll party on the weekends. And so, you know, it was a bit of just like, hey, yeah, I'm in my 20s and, and just, you know, white knuckling it in this environment that um, I was like, I don't know how I ended up here. And um, in, in kind of these working with high profile, uh, super productive people. So uh, coming back to like the experimentation stuff, uh, none of it worked. And I remember thinking like, man, I don't want to end my life, but I certainly don't want to live this way for the rest of my life. Like this, this is not sustainable. I I won't, I know I won't make it. I won't make it if this is how I feel all the, all the time. Yeah. And then, uh, around that time, um, I visited my friend in Austin and in his apartment, I stumbled across a book called play by Dr. Stuart Brown. And, I sat down and I read the whole book in one sitting and just kind of laughed as I was reading it because I realized like <clears throat> there were a number of quotes that stood out. Like one was um, the opposite of play isn't work. It's depression. Mm-hmm. And then another one was a lack of play should be treated like malnutrition. It's a mm-hmm. health risk to your body and mind. And I'd never really considered it that much of how, wow, yeah, we did evolve. We're, we're among the most playful species on the planet, inarguably. And um, interestingly, you know, like it's, it's also the most attractive trait to both sexes. 
uh, playfulness because it's an indicator of mental well-being and safety yeah. and vitality. Mm. And uh, the fruits of our play have created society. And mm -hmm. um, sorry, one sec. Um, they've, they've literally shaped society, culture, art, every, everything we value, every invent, invention, innovation. And yet we kind of categorize it as like, hey, this is kind of this, you know, this thing is relegated to childhood. Yeah. You grow up and then you become serious and you think about success and money and like uh, work. Work is w the thing. And uh, I just became both fascinated by this concept of like, why, first of all, like, and in, in what is the actual distinction between work and play? Because clearly there are people who play for a living and they're highly valued in society. They get paid disproportionately. So what is it about those people that makes this acceptable? And all the others are not allowed to get paid to play. They have to get paid to work. And uh, it's a fair question. They have to work to get paid. I mean, and, um, but it, but at the time it was more just like uh, okay this is this is like the one thing I haven't tried, and so the next day somebody invited me for a coffee meeting and I was like well why don't we just go play catch at the park instead, and so we had a catch meeting. After that, I felt lightness and like a little bit of a weight had fallen off. Thought, that's interesting. Okay. So I started doing that every day. I would have catch meetings every day and uh, would play home run derby with my buddy on the weekend. I felt better. Found myself starting to do pranks and practical jokes, which I hadn't done in many years, you know, since like probably college. Yeah. And, um, and I, and I then signed up for uh, improv comedy classes, which is like the exact opposite impulse somebody struggling with anxiety is going to have right, right? It's like that's yeah, so good i feel afraid all the time why don't i go look Get on like stage. an idiot in front of strangers right it's like oh. uh and so but what i learned is that improv is actually the most harmonious um mm. it is it is literally play for adults like kids perfectly will do improv effortlessly without any thought. They will follow the rules exactly because they don't even know those rules exist. They're just effortless players. And so like you have, you have kids yourself, mm -hmm. you know, when, when they were younger, if you handed them something invisible and said, here's a present for you, they might open it up. They might say, thank you. I've been wanting a dog, you know, like they, it's it's easy for them, but you do that to an adult, and there's just like restriction. Ego gets in the way. Like, yeah. no, this doesn't. This isn't harmonious with my identity as a sober, responsible, professional adult who people take seriously, right? Yep. And so, um, anyway, within a month of just adding play back into my life, it's totally symptom free, and. Um, it, it it just dissolved away pretty effortlessly. And what happened was, I was like, huh, that's super interesting. I wrote about it, and uh, I decided to publish it online, just like how I cured my anxiety. I put it up. That was in 2013, 2012. And for the next five years, it was the number one result worldwide if you looked up anxiety yeah, I, cure, I've seen that cure anxiety, right? And so this thing that I was embarrassed about and ashamed of, I was like, wow, a lot of people have this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know. I had no idea because I didn't tell anybody except my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, wow, this seems to be quite universal. And so uh, it compelled me to expand on it and turn it into a book. And uh, the book is called Play It Away. But um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the story of how I, how I got myself out. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, 
there's some interesting, powerful imagery. I feel like I, I really felt your moment on the stage of the conference burning out, not sleeping for four days practically, and yet just getting the standing ovation. Like how much is that our culture, at least in Western America, you know, the Westernized America culture, um, that was palpable. And then uh, it's so fascinating to me how I don't know where it comes from or when it happens, but the switch from child to adult where we, you know, so much of our life is identity. You could really trace a lot of things back to identity issues. And so like at one point we're trying to like identify as an adult. And so we just adopt, I guess the identities of an adult. And so I, we do lose play. And I I've dealt with that right as, as I got more um, successful in business. And so then that became an identity and me, like I remember at one point realizing I don't have any hobbies. I don't do anything for fun, purely for fun. Like the thing I used to do for fun, which was music, my whole life, singer, songwriter, like that, I turned that into a YouTube channel and a business and now I teach that. So that's not fun anymore. That's, that's not my work. And so I needed to find something unrelated to that. And that was, I sat on my, my like, like swing outside of my wife. And I was like, I, what, what should I do for fun? And she's like, whatever you want. I'm like, I just can't think of anything. And she's like, you got a problem. So I, I know that feeling of like, wow, I, I have to be an adult now, but what happened? When did that happen? So it just it felt very real to me. Um, when you say play, because this is, this is you know what you're writing about. Um, and, and real quick, uh, before I even get to that question, thank you for sharing about your article because I wanted to get into your article because I'm a content creator. That's what I'm teaching people to do. How powerful, can you just give me a quick like synopsis, how powerful was it for you um, to see not only that other people deal with anxiety, but that like, you published something just about your experience and it blew up. Like, what was that experience like and what doors did that open up other than obviously the book and multiple books? Yeah. Well, I do want to say, and I'll answer that. Thank you for sharing that, uh, that you experienced that challenge because that I have um, surveyed thousands of people, right, in person at speaking events and stuff, uh, what is the number one thing that gets in the way of you having fun? What do you think it is? I'm guessing their work. I'm afraid of what other people will think of me. Mm. Which, I don't know if that resonates for you, but it's so common among adults that I, th I certainly thought it was worth mentioning because it, it started to make me sad when I kept hearing that over and over and over uh, because it, it really just translates to, I'm afraid if I'm myself, mm. people will reject me. Yeah. That I won't be loved. And I think what you brought up is an important point, which is like, I'm not sure when that transition happens. And I think for, for some people, it's just like the incentives go away, right? You're, you're no longer incentivized, it seems, to play anymore. But for mm -hmm. a hobby, for instance, it's like you're not incentivized to sleep other than it makes you more productive, right? Uh, you're not getting paid to sleep. Right. Unless you run a passive income business, whatever. But like, sure. you're you're not getting paid to sleep. Uh, so people are like, I gotta I gotta sleep less, and I gotta cut out the frivolous hobbies and stuff. When in reality, it's like, you no know, more sleep makes you more productive. You know, slow is smooth, and smooth is fast, so so to speak. And same with hobbies. Like hobbies, they found uh, Nobel Prize winners are. 31 times more likely to have multiple hobbies in areas outside of their field mm. that help them synergize new information and like make their work even better. So, um, so anyway, I, I just want to like, there, there are clear obstacles people have, and they're almost always emotional internal hurdles about, I'm afraid, you know, I'm not going to come across as responsible anymore if I start being myself or like I'm afraid people will think I'm a, a nerd or like a clown. And to be clear, like I'm not asking anybody to be Michael Scott, you know, like from the sure. office and like bounce off the walls and distract people. Uh, that's, that's not my definition of play at all. And to your, 
your question, um, my apologies, Graham, I got us off track. It was your no, question effectively, uh, like, uh, what is play? Right. I mean, how do I define it? Was, was that it? Well, I, I do want to get to that, but I'm even before we move to that, your article just as like a side tangent oh, rabbit yes, trail. Yes. Cause that's such, that's a powerful, like an example, like I te- I believe in the power of content. And when you are authentically sharing your experience, there's probably other people that will share it. And so people are afraid to publish or they're like, no one will ever pay attention, but you publish an article and it's ranking number one on Google for years on dealing with anxiety. What was that experience like for you becoming a, a content creator in that regard? Yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. Uh, so I've been writing online since 2008 and, um, that was probably the most vulnerable thing I'd shared. I'd had other stuff go viral, but, um, I, at the time, I think I, that content specifically benefited from there not being very much good personal information out there from relatable people. Because my experience was like, okay, there's the cut and dry, you know, uh, healthcare medical establishment uh, take on this. Um, And then there's people who I just don't relate to at all. It's like the... They have a lot of anxiety, but their life is chaos and a mess. And it's like they're, you know, you know, I didn't really have that problem. Like my life on paper and by all outside appearances was fairly orderly, I think. Um, some might disagree. I don't know. But like, um, and so sharing my story, I think, was, was uh, you know, this thing that I think everybody was afraid to say or couldn't articulate publicly. And so it just immediately just like struck a lightning type chord. And I think I've only had that happen a couple other times in the years I've created content. But um, I think there's a ton of power in being truthful in your story. Mm -hmm. And the more that you share the painful, dark, ugly truth in the shadow side of, of the human experience that we all tend to uh, try and suppress and hide from others. Um, the, the better that content's going to do. And especially if it's a story, you know, if I just listed off, like, here's what I did to get over my anxiety, like never would have taken off, but I kind of pulled people through like, look, this is the hell that I went through. You got to understand, like, it was very real. Like I'm not making this up. And, um, yeah, for, for any other content creators, like telling it in a story and being as truthful and honest as possible, uh, it goes a really long way. And it was fascinating because I think millions of people ended up reading the article. I had uh, definitely over a thousand people email me uh, and comment over the years and, and say things. And um, it kind of, uh, to be honest, it, like it threw me a little bit off uh, because... I'm a firm believer now that if you're somebody who has something to say, you kind of have to lead the market, so to speak. Mm. You, you can't have the market wag you around and be like, Oh, it seems like everybody's talking about web 3.0 right now in crypto. I should probably talk about that. It's like, no, no, no. Don't be an AI expert. If just because people are talking about it. So, um, and, and I think it, it kind of messed me up in that way where I was like, wow, there's such a demand. There's so many people that need help with this. I should probably like create some more products around this or like a service or like kind of really throw myself into the mental health world. And that I think was probably my greatest mistake. It, it just, it was like, it, write the book and have it be that, you know, just like mm-hmm. plant that seed into the humans, humanity's body of knowledge and let it go and mm. move on. You know, that's, that's hindsight 2020. That's what I w- wish I would have done, but, um, I, I learned a ton from the experience regardless and helped a lot of people. So I can't complain. Hey friend, we'll get back to the episode in just a moment, but I wanted to give you a gift for hanging out with me today. I want to give you my 30 day online income jumpstart guide. This is a four week checklist bullet points to go from zero audience, zero customers, maybe even zero idea of what your business should be to putting money in your pocket 30 
days from now. It won't be a million dollars in 30 days, but it will be money in your pocket. You will have figured out your idea. You will have tested your idea. You will have launched your idea and taken massive action towards building a business and a life that you love. If you already know your business idea, but you've been sitting around and you haven't taken action on it, then you need this guy because it'll walk you through a four-week plan to go from where you are to putting money in your pocket in 30 days. And if you've never figured out what your business idea is and you have no followers online and no audience, it's okay. This will help you start at zero. I promise you. It's a PDF. It's fast. It's easy to read. It's not an ebook. You don't have to spend a lot of time on this. It's more about taking action and doing the right things in the right order. And it's free as my gift to you. So just go to grahamcochran.com slash jumpstart to get your 30-day online income jumpstart guide. It's grahamcochran.com slash jumpstart. Now back to the episode. Thanks for sharing that. That's a great little tangent. I think there's a, that was a mini masterclass for people on content creation. Um, you know, A, being truthful, being authentic. I, I've always felt that there's always room for someone else to jump into a niche if you can just be relatable to someone else. And, and you can't control if you're relatable to everybody because you won't be, but you will certainly be more relatable to someone than someone else. And I know when I got into music production or recording, I wasn't the first person to educate in that space, but I was the first non-boring person. I thought everyone else was very <laughs> linear and like a professor. And I was like, this is supposed to be a fun, creative thing. You should speak as if it's a fun, creative thing. So that was to my advantage. Um, so I love how you said you were relatable. I love how you shared that it was storytelling. And I know you, you, know, you have a, a powerful TEDx talk about this, about the power of play. Um, I, I'm I'm literally memorizing my TEDx talk right now. I, I go on the stage in like oh, nice. a month and a half. So I'm, I'm new to this world and I'm excited to share. But um, as you know, to give a powerful TED talk or TEDx talk, you, you don't just stand up and here are the facts about play or here are the facts about anxiety. Like it doesn't work. Like the format needs you to be a human. You need to be sharing stories that that people almost forget that they're listening to a talk. Like they're just connected with you. And then it's, it like sets the table for you to be able to be like, here's what I've discovered or here's what the science says. And like people are like, oh, wow, and they can digest it. So I just love that you, you just in a moment just gave people like the building blocks of great content creation. Oh, thanks, man. And congrats on that. What is, what is your TEDx talk going to be? It's going to be about uh, why giving money away makes you a happier person. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's true. Have you read uh, the, the Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Shin? Ooh, no, I'll add that to my list. So it's it's from like the 1920s. And this woman was one of the first self-help uh, personal development type authors uh, ever. And I, I think this book is is really fascinating and interesting. Uh, I've, I've had debates about it with, uh, I have friends who are not so spiritual and some are who are like really religious. And so their takes are all different. Uh, but the book talks about like, yeah, like, you know, how you communicate with the universe, with others, with I mean, around money dictates how money comes in. And so mm. like one of the great concepts in the book is uh, dig your trenches. You know, if you expect to get rich, um, to, was it Napoleon or somebody who, who like – he came and he was like, are you guys prepared for the flood? And they're like, yes, we're prepared. He's like, no, you're not. You haven't dug the trenches. You don't think the flood's coming. Mm. And so it's similar with money. And also it's like, yeah, it's like it, the, the filter or whatever goes both ways. Like if you're giving, like that's the power of tithing, right? Is, is, yep. uh, you give and you get in, in return. So sorry to steal <laughs> your TED talk. I'm so no, this sorry. is great, I'm man. I'm excited about that topic. It's a, it's a great topic. And uh, I, I love that you're going to give that. So are, are oh, you ready man. to give the talk? Yeah, I mean, I'm getting there. I, I just, I'm finishing memorizing and I got to just keep practicing it and, and get to the point where it's, it's so crystal clear for me. But I'm getting excited. I just bought that book. Thanks for that recommendation, by the way. Yeah, I mean, and that's a side tangent, but um, it, it is related in the sense that, you know, may, maybe you felt this, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but during your journey of dealing with your anxiety and trying to figure it out, it, it almost is like this self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're so focused on yourself, trying to like fix yourself and like your eyes are on yourself and man, there's so many things that happen in life when you're just so focused on yourself, whether good or bad, like I'm, I'm great or I'm not good enough. It's the same internal like self 
focused life. And then when you put your focus on other people, and that can be through serving people with your time, that can be giving money to causes and people that you care about. It really releases you from sort of that self inward focus. And I find that when I'm giving or serving someone else or like volunteering at my church or, you know, that we have a food bank down here that we support here in Tampa. Like I, I sort of like, I'm happier because I'm not thinking about myself and overanalyzing my problems. And so I, I think it's all very much related. Totally. Yeah. So it, there's, there's a little bit of nuance on that, right? Because like one of the things I tried when I was getting, trying to get out of this state of anxiety was volunteering. You know, I, I, I held that exact sure. same hypothesis of like, if I just focus on other people, I can get myself in a better spot. And I found it didn't work as well as I'd hoped. And I think there's a few reasons for this. So first off, like they've done studies on animals where they deprive them of play, right? They prevent them from playing. And all of those animals become socially crippled. Mm. They become afraid of interacting with other members of their species and sometimes will lash out inappropriately. Right, and so they'll they'll assume uh, a playful invitation is actually like a threat. Wow! And the, I'm, we've we've all met people who are kind of like that. Yep. It's just like so. Um, what I learned, and there's another great book called uh, "The Four Habits of a Joy Filled Marriage." And uh, yeah, great in this book. book that, it. Yeah, yeah. So the number one habit in that book is play. And what they talk about is fear bonds versus joy bonds. And fear bonds is like, you know, you're afraid to be yourself around the person. You're kind of on edge. It feels like you're walking on eggshells and yada, yada, yada. Joy bonds, the opposite. You feel you can be at home uh, with them. You can be totally yourself. Like there's free flowing, positive, loving, fun energy. You cannot have a joy bond unless you play with the individual. It's literally impossible to create a joy bond any other way apart from you have played together in some capacity. You've had fun together, right? And so I think that's part of the reason why I didn't quite get the benefits from volunteering is like, I didn't, I still didn't know these people. I still was wrapped up in fear. And even though I can focus on them and kind of like distract myself from myself for a bit, Mm-hmm. I was still dealing with kind of that that fear bonded mm. state. That's is that, is that clear? Yeah, that's a great uh, nuance because it's it's really not just the serving that helps or the giving. Like you can give money away, but if you're in a place of fear or or duty, right? Especially if you have a religious background and you feel like obligated to give. You know, like even the Bible talks about God loves a cheerful giver. And the word in the Greek is the word for hilarious, right? So it's anybody can just give. That's not the magic. It's the state of like release. And like you said, there's these joy bonds. And and when you were talking about that, and I love that book, by the way, I think about that with work and team. If you have a team at all, like if you have no playful experience with your team or coworkers or like, you're never going to have the same level of like, I feel at home, I can be myself, I feel supported, I could support you. It's very territorial because you've never created that bond. So that's what came to mind for me. And I know you've, you've talked about that. Um, and you, and you, you have a lot of experience with that. I mean, maybe apply some of this real quick. What would you say? How, what is play for the entrepreneur? Um, maybe a solopreneur. So maybe it's not like team, like what, what, how could we incorporate, what is play? How can we incorporate it into our day so that we don't become burned out? We don't become, we don't get the applause, you know, like you did, but inside it's really, really a, a sad situation. Yes. Yeah. So it's a great question. So, um, a lot of people I think assume wrongfully that when I talk about play, they, they just immediately think, oh, like make work a fun environment, make work fun, you know, like have, have like ping pong tables, uh, happy hours, do retreats, uh, you know, like do, do all the, like turn your office into Google and yeah, hopefully like picturing. have the Michael Scott, you know, dynamic kind of going on, but without de- derailing productivity. Um, and that's actually not what I'm talking about at all. Um, those things have their place and I think they are good. And there have been some really good books written on, on the benefits of that. Like fish 
is the name of a book about the Seattle or like the I think it's uh, the the fish market in Seattle. I forget the name of the market, but yeah, Pike Place Market. Yes, uh, and and how playful they are, and and like how they basically created that into this huge thing just by being playful. That's yeah. it. Like that's all they do. And they have such a, a wonderful work environment. A lot of people have like emulated that. And I think it's great. What I'm actually more talking about is what I talked about in this book, Play for a Living, which is that each of us is capable of being a great player. And so I, when I hear companies say like, oh, we're a family, it's like, no, I don't, don't be a family. Like, I don't want, I think that's actually unhealthy. I think you're a team. Mm. And what do great teams have in common? They unleash the greatness of the individual players and then they learn to play with each other. Like you talk about the Bulls, how different was Michael Jordan from Dennis Rodman? Like yeah. entirely different. But they are both Hall of Famers who are amazing at what they do because they leaned fully into who they are as players. And so I'm talking a bit more about that and kind of the criteria I've kind of run through my head is freedom, mastery, uh, connection, purpose, and recess. And you can uh, you you can kind of memorize the acronym as like, play mother effer, you know, purpose, <laughs> mastery, <laughs> yeah. freedom, uh, you know, connection, uh, recess. So um, I think the, the first one that's actually the most important is mastery. Are you in a seat mm. that you want to level up in? Like, do you enjoy the process? So like an example is, I've been editing video for two decades. I meet video people regularly, video editors who are like, oh, I hate editing. I'm like, good, leave. Don't do yeah. it because it sucks for you. It's awesome for people like me. And like I, as an editor, like people will come to me and be like, oh, I had a terrible experience with an editor. It's because they didn't like what they did. So don't like... Or, you know, they're, they're just not high enough in, in the mastery chain to be worth working with or whatever. But, yeah. like, do you, would you – I wrote about the benefits of free work 15 years ago, and I still stand by it today, is if you were not getting paid to do the work, would you quit very soon? Because, like – I did video editing for years before anyone paid me because I yep. loved it. I thought it was super cool. I still think it's super cool. And there's endless levels of mastery. Like I'll never achieve mastery. It's this endless, yeah. you know, leveling up. Uh, the second one is freedom. So are you free of micromanaging BS? Are you free of people like surveilling you, trying to pressure you externally to do the work, are you able to be intrinsically motivated? Mm. And that's the strongest form of motivation for sticking of with course. anything is, is play. It's not purpose. I don't think you start with why. I think you mm. that comes later. You start with play, and that's mm. really mastery and freedom. Oh, I, I then, like that. That's a, that's a great point. Yeah, it's, it's the truth. I mean, it's, kids don't need to be externally motivated to play. They will just do it. They don't need, they're not like, why? You know, what's the purpose behind this? <laughs> they're not little activity? philosophers. It's like, <laughs> you're hitting a balloon in the air. That's the yeah, activity. Yeah, it's just fun, bro. <laughs> there, there is no purpose. It's fun. Um, and mm. then connection is really just like, do you feel connected with the other people you're playing with? Um, do you feel that you're connected with people you admire and respect because they're good at what they do? Yeah. You know, it's like, Going back to the Jordan Rodman analogy, it's like Rodman was a party animal. Jordan was his own, I guess, kind of party animal. But he was like, they total respect for each other. You couldn't be more different. Yeah. Right? And then uh, purpose. You need rules to the game. Like you need some sort of like, okay, there's a goal that we're ultimately driving toward, but like the journey matters most, right? And then uh, recess. Recess is the final. Like, you, you need to take breaks. Mm. You will burn out 
if you don't take regular breaks or at least like I heard Mr. Beast does it in kind of a funny way where he'll just like work all day for a week or two uh, all day long each day. And then he'll just be like, I got to take like a day or two off. Cool. Like whatever your recess is, take it, you know, for people like Einstein, they would go on walks and play violin. You know, for me, I'd like, I like playing catch. I like, you know, strumming on guitar a little bit. Yeah. Video games. I'd like video games. You know, it's like yeah. whatever you need. The important thing there is psychological detachment. You have to step away. This is why people have great ideas in the showers and when they sleep. Mm-hmm. It's like you take your mind off of the task at hand um, to to go do something else. And uh, I think recess is like this thing that we attribute to. Oh, it's that's definitely for kids and and like. You know, Finland's number one education system in the world. They take four times more recess than we do. Yes. Um, so I think it, it goes back to the, uh, you know, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And recess bakes in, you get a, a kick a back of um, dopamine, uh, which makes you more productive and, and yeah. endorphin rush. Like it just maximizes the chemicals in your brain on that level. But it also just like it, it mitigates against stress. Microsoft did a great uh, study where they showed two groups, one that did four hours straight of, uh, of conference video calls. And another group that took little breaks between those calls. And they, d- they did scans of their brains the first group that didn't take any breaks, their their brains were red, like totally lit up and like it's super stressed out, right? Second break, totally mitigated against against that. And they, I think they took like one or two breaks. So take recess. It matters. So that's what I mean by play. It's like kind of this holistic thing. Yeah. Um, but it's not, hey, let's let's have a ping pong table in happy yeah. hours like that that is one of five components yeah yeah that's huge i mean i i love um i love how you started with you know like what i'm what i'm helping people do or trying to help people do is is not just find a way to make a living online or make something that's you know passive income like there's a million things you could do to make money. It's it's like here's an opportunity to marry something you you like doing, you you know something about that's fun for you, and and incorporate that into the way you make a living. So you're sort of starting from the fun, as opposed to your purpose, your deep philosophical why maybe, um, and that will probably come out. But the other thing you said too, and my buddy Jordan Rayner wrote a great book about this called Master of One that, you know, there's a lot of studies showing that mastery, like if you like something, you're going to do a good job of it. But it's this beautiful cycle that the more mastery you get in a subject, if it's something you actually enjoy, the more you actually enjoy it. Uh, so it really is worth finding a lane that you enjoy that you could do in your mind for the next 10, 20 years, because it's just fun for you. You will more likely get more mastery, which will make it more fun. And then you'll connect with cool people in that space. And connection is so powerful and that makes it more fun. And uh, I think the hard one, though, for my students that have gotten successful and really are world class at what they do and they're, they love it is the recess part, is the taking breaks, even though if I were to pull my people, they would say one of the reasons why they wanted an online business was so they had more time, more flexibility. There's like this ironic inner fear of maybe running out of money or, you know, people surpassing them or becoming less important in the public eye. If you're a content creator that keeps them driving and they have a hard time taking breaks, they have a hard time, like, you know, the concept of Sabbath that the, the Jew, Jewish you know tradition has of like work six days, rest one day, and having, even having rhythms where you would shut things down in the evening. Um, like that rhythm of taking rest, like I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that's where so many of the ideas, like you said, the connections happen and your brain can just, literally when you sleep, it can like rinse out all the, the mess inside your brain and reset. Um, but that for some reason is hard for people because especially when they like what they do. Yeah, totally. And that's why, you know, there's, there's a few tips that, that can be helpful if you're like, yeah, I I recognize what I'm doing is, is tough and everything. Uh, and I do need to take breaks. Um, there's, there's a few things I've found that work well. Uh, number one, just like 
schedule your play like pay to be in some sort of group uh that that meets regularly so you have some skin in the game you're accountable and uh it's it's just like baked into your schedule so that's that's probably one of the easier ones and even easier one is like take all your calls walking outside like yeah, it, it make it super super basic like you, you don't have to have it be this complicated grand gesture keep it basic um another few things is like keep things on you that can make it easy uh in in your environment so you set up your environment so that play is like uh a reminder uh or um is is within reach so i have like a baseball glove hung up on the wall i have a nintendo switch in my laptop bag i've got a guitar back here you know books is like a form of psychological detachment like that is play for me yeah. very much so um and so those are back there and you know like another thing i started doing two years ago that i thought was uh great i was peer pressured into this by my wife but uh uh it was it was a wise move is um i just get i, I work for myself now so do, like but i get off at four i quit at four yeah. you know and so um I work really hard. I get a lot of stuff done, <laughs> but, yeah. uh, and I, and I know other people who are like, Oh, I take every Friday off and I'm yeah. actually working my way up to that. Right. Yeah. And so, um, another highly thing, if you, if you have the, sorry, what's that? Oh, highly recommend it. Yeah. Fridays off are great. Yeah. 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 And, um, uh, if, if you have the budget, if you're an entrepreneur, it's like get an assistant and have this be part of their responsibilities is holding you to task and scheduling stuff for you because you suck at taking care of yourself. <laughs> like you suck at your schedule. You're not an assistant. You're an entrepreneur. And so delegate, give that to them and, and just tell them like, I want to be tip top shape. If you want to add massages or gym time or whatever else you want to add in to their, like, I, I think it's crazy that we think of like, okay, we all know we need eight hours of sleep. We all know we need eight cups of water a day. How many hours of play do we need? How many play mm. experiences do we need per week? No one has any idea. And they, <laughs> they, they usually don't even have them, right? So mm. um, I think it's just like, give yourself something small first. For me, it was the catch meetings. It could be walking and yeah. talking meetings for you. I don't care. Just, just like begin an experiment. And see what happens. Like you will be surprised and delighted that nothing falls off the rails. Your life gets a little bit better, yeah. and you feel a little bit more at peace very quickly. I love. Nothing I love. Those are great suggestions. Yeah, you know, for me, like the same. The environment's important. I've got two guitars on this wall. Can't see, but I got a little like Mario statues and C three PO statue on the bookshelf behind me. A football. Uh, anything to phys physically when I walk in the office to see it and go, Oh yeah, I like fun stuff too. remind me of that in my environment. And that's easy to set up. And then walking, um, not even just talking, like even just walking in silence. Uh, uh we have the river walk here in Tampa and there's, we walk on Bayshore Boulevard by the water. It's just so beautiful for me. And it's like open space. And I, I remember complaining for months, like I never have time to walk. And my wife's like, don't you have a passive income business and you can do whatever you want? Like, what are you <laughs> saying? You don't have time. And I was like, oh, I'm real. I'm not scheduling the time. It's my own fault to your point. So that's the first thing I'll do like three days a week is I'll come in and go for a two hour walk uh, after I drop the kids off at school before I do anything. Um, and I come in so much more like refreshed and like, whether it's to jump on an awesome interview with someone like you or to work on my TEDx talk or to create a new product or whatever it is, record a podcast, I feel alive and, um, I don't feel like I'm a slave to my own business that I created, which I think my audience can, they don't, they don't understand that when they're new, they're like, I just want to make money. Then you start to make money and you realize I'm creating my own little prison that like, that I'm a slave to. So it's, it's very important to be having these conversations. So those were very practical, um, great examples. Thank you for sharing those, man. Yeah, for sure. And one other thing I think that is important for everybody to keep in mind, if you grew up in America, you inherited the system that's been shaped by the Protestant work ethic, by industrialists, uh, by people who had completely different agendas than the world we live in today. And one of the byproducts of that is we view time as an expense, as a loss, and we say, I don't have time. 
I'm mm. spending time, right? It's like a very consumerist kind of yeah. uh, uh, mentality. Whereas a lot of these other cultures uh, that kind of have, you know, more at peace existences and they kind of vibrate at a calmer <laughs> state, uh, they view it as passing the time. Mm. You're just going through it. You know, you, it's just always going through. You're on a ride, man. You know, yeah. this isn't a thing. And I think it's, it's – we get into this trap where we're cutting up time, slicing mm. and dicing it every which way and being like, this is how this expense will go out. Instead of just being on the journey, on the ride – and uh, I think it's just something helpful to, you know, it's easy for us to forget this is the world we, we inherited. Um, but I think when you play, that illusion of time, which it is, is it gets shattered and you experience flow, which is mm. timelessness. And this, mm. it, this applies both to uh, having recess with your kids or your friends or getting paid to play, doing yeah. the thing that you're wanting to master, that you feel deeply connected with. And so I think that is the more desirable state, is timelessness and not experiencing, even thinking about the time. Because no one has ever gone to a dinner party with their best friends and been having a wonderful time laughing and everything. And, uh, you know... Like in and, and just been like, oh man, we're we are spending time. We are spending <laughs> a lot of time <laughs> like on this oh boy. My gosh. Uh there's no guilt there because mm. it's joy in its mm. play. So uh I think that is the more optimal state. I won't say it is the optimal state, I don't know, but I, I find it to be uh a, certainly a better state than being anxious and worried uh about how how to live your life. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I, I received that personally. That's beautiful. I, I know I want to be respect, respectful of your time. We want to finish. There's one segment I like to do in the show um, to get a little more philosophical. Um, I call it the golden rule segment. And it's pretty simple. Like you have kids, you have daughters like me. Um, you're, you're teaching them a lot. You're going to teach them a lot and they're going to learn a lot. But let's imagine they forgot everything that you taught them except for one thing, one piece of wisdom, one philosophy, a, a golden rule, as it were, what would you hope that one thing would be that they would take away? Hmm. Do you have an answer to this? Hmm. I do, but that's not, that's not how the rules go in this game, man. You got to answer it for me. <laughs> okay. Give me a moment. I want to think about this because it's a very good question. It's not going to have anything to do with what we talked about. You know, I could very much make this into, uh, well, wouldn't you know it, Graham? This is totally aligned with my marketing message. No. Yes, no, um, it's not supposed to. Whatever comes to heart. <laughs> I, I think there's a, a lot of importance in repair, uh, rupture and repair in relationships is people hurt each other's feelings. Uh, it is the human condition. We're sensitive and we take things personally and we also misinterpret things. And um, we d it's very hard to feel completely understood mm. by somebody else. And um, we also have these programs that we inherit from our parents, from the, the, you know our ancestors, from the media, the culture we grew up in, we inherit all these programs, and they're baked into they get baked into our minds as a means of here's how to get through life, here's how to operate in the world, stay safe, 
reproduce, you know, the, like these programs help us the m much of the time, but when they get tripped up and it's like a, big program and you, you know you freak out and the other person's like what the hell is going on with you mm -hmm. like this is the human condition right and a lot of people can call them traumas or what I, I just think it's helpful to think of them as programs like software they just mm -hmm. get kicked up and in those instances it's very easy for especially if two people trigger their programs and they it's like two minds coming together and they both explode I think it's very easy for people to get so bent out of shape, hurt, ruptured, that they don't seek understanding, they don't seek forgiveness, they don't seek to apologize. And I think if there's anything I've learned being married, having um, kids, is the importance of uh, seeking to understand seeking to apologize and seeking to forgive. And um, I think that would be the most important thing uh, that I would want my kids to carry with them is to be ready to apologize, try to understand, and be ready to forgive. Wow. What a thoughtful answer. I love that. So beautiful. I really appreciate you even taking the time to think that through. Um, Charlie, you're an incredible human being, man. I've, I've loved my time with you. I just have the, through the screen, I just have a sense of connection with you that's very real and very palpable. And I, I, I don't say that lightly. So just thank you for sharing your full self. This was wonderful conversation for me selfishly. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed it. Where can people find you online? The book is played away. You have other books as well. I want everyone to go check out a copy of that. But where do you, um, do you hang out with people online? Where can people reach out to you if they just want to say thank you or, or ask you any questions? Well, th thank you, Graham. Thank you for having me. And thanks for the, the kind interview and uh, for letting me share my story, man. Um, yes, uh, charliehone.com. If you uh, just search my name um, and all my stuff you can find on there pretty easily. Perfect. Charlie, thank you for your time, brother. Just excited for you. Glad to see you having continued success. You're doing good stuff in the world. So keep it up, my man. My pleasure. Thanks again, Graham. Well, that's it for my conversation with Charlie Hone. I don't know about you, but I feel like going and doing something fun right now. <laughs> so uh, I loved this conversation. I loved Charlie's approach and just his humility and honesty. I got so many ideas from this conversation. And I know the more I lean into play and life-giving activities, the more fruitful and productive my business actually is. Please go check out more of what Charlie's doing. Check out his book, Play It Away. You can check out all of that at charliehone.com or follow him on social media at charliehone, H-O-E-H-N. As always, I appreciate your time. Thanks for hanging out with us today. I hope it was valuable and insightful for you, and I'll see you on another episode real soon. <laughs>